The interesting thing about Michael is that people don't know that he's actually spent quite a lot of time in prison. He hasn't actually served a sentence, but he has served those who are serving sentences. And there are very few high-profile people in public life who make prisons their priority. Michael does. He's been a long-time um, friend of the uh, Prison Reform Trust, and he's also, uh, he told me as, as I came in, uh, been very active with action for, I can't read my writing, family. Prisoners' families, yeah, prisoners' families. Uh, if I can't read my own writing up here, whatever happens to the news? But there we are. <laughs> um, but uh, thank goodness I have made a joke before he does. But um, <laughs> seriously, it's my very great pleasure. It's an absolute thrill to have Michael Payne in here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I feel very honored to have been asked to give the Longford Lecture this year and somewhat overawed, especially having the nicest man in the cabinet in the front row. <laughs> I'll do my best. I've called this lecture Collateral Damage, the Effects of Prison Sentences on Offenders' Families. I believe there's only one starting point when considering the efficacy of a prison sentence. And that is how successful it can be in combining punishment with prevention from reoffending. One of the most important elements in this equation is the family of the offender. This was acknowledged by Lord Wolfe in his report after the Strange Ways riot of 1990, when one of his central recommendations was that there should be better prospects for prisoners to retain their links with families. It was reiterated by Charles Clarke when he was Home Secretary. Addressing the question of successful resettlement, he noted, we need to remember the vital role of family, friends, and community. And it was underlined more recently in a review from the Inspectorate of Prisons, which recognized, and I quote, the central importance of an offender's family and friends to their successful rehabilitation. The influence of the family relationship on the mental and physical state of the offender is profound. It can be damaging or it can be powerfully beneficial. One thing it can't be is ignored. Yet my own feeling, backed up by reports, conversations and a wealth of anecdotal evidence, is that this is precisely what families of offenders feel is happening. From the moment an arrest is made, the family is intimately involved, sometimes quite brutally so. Doors can be broken open and rooms searched, personal belongings seized, parents handcuffed and hauled away in front of their children, brothers and sisters in front of their siblings. If not present at the time of the arrest, family members will often find it hard to glean information about the reason for the arrest, the location to which their arrested relative has been taken, and what access if any, they will be allowed. An arrest warrant does not come with any description of their legal rights. The marginalization of the family begins from the very first moment of detention. Even if the person detained is eventually proven guilty in court, there can be no excuse for adding lack of information to the emotional shock already imposed. My partner had nothing to do with it. My children had nothing to do with it. It's just that their lives have been thrown into a tornado by what I'd done, was one testimony I heard. The guilt is there on both sides, and stigma by association is a theme reiterated by almost all the family members I talk to. They have committed no crime, but they're made to feel as if they're accomplices just because they're related. After the arrest and before trial comes the remand stage, a judicial limbo land which can last weeks or even months, adding the extra burden of uncertainty to the feelings of guilt and shame that are already present, along with loss of earnings and in some cases media intrusion, local press revelations and the resulting strain on friendships and social life. As no formal charge of wrongdoing has been proven, 
One would expect this to be a time when the family were able to keep in contact, but many report being kept in the dark as to where their family member is being held and what rights of access they might have to them. Making communication difficult at this early stage only strengthens the suspicion that both individual and collective guilt is assumed before the case has even come to court. The trial period can be particularly unsettling for both families and the accused. The process of justice is intimidating and often difficult to follow. One mother, Paula, made one powerful point. Everyone I met on my journey to court, police officer, custody sergeant, duty solicitor, prosecuting barrister, my barrister, the judges, all male. Some, especially those with children in school, find it physically impossible to attend court every day. One woman who wasn't present to see her partner sentenced was not informed by anyone about the verdict. These things may seem incredible to those of us who can get ourselves organized, but many family members are vulnerable with mental and physical health problems. Confused, shunned by friends, their confidence eroded during the long remand process, these are the people who need help from within the criminal justice system, but so often find that they're left to sink or swim. Did anyone ever ask you about how your family will be affected? I asked Paula. No, she told me. They were just interested in the process and enforcing the penalty. Once the accused becomes the convicted, a different set of pressures comes to bear on the families. The possibility of innocence or wrongful arrest is no longer a sustaining hope. They must now live with the reality of incarceration and a criminal record. Just when the going gets tougher, the state and society turn their backs. Justice has been done. A sentence must be served. But why should the families themselves have to be punished? Committing an offense does not mean that feelings of love and affection are suddenly negated, and it's not the families who've been incarcerated. Depriving them of contact or just making, making contact difficult is penalizing the innocent as well as the guilty. The story of one young man shows the cruel price the innocent can pay. Jacob lived with his younger brother and his mother, a care worker who had looked after children on a troubled estate for 15 years. Her work had been judged outstanding by Ofsted. One night he had gone to the help of his friend in a pub and had thrown a punch and knocked a man to the floor. A month later, police came round to the house and arrested him. The man he had punched had hit his head on the floor and later died. Jacob was put on bail. Because he'd just turned 18 years, the nature of his alleged crime was deemed to be confidential. For two weeks, as evidence was being gathered, his own mother was not allowed to be told what her son was accused of. To make matters worse, Ofsted suspended her from her job on the grounds that she had failed to inform them that she had allowed a man facing a criminal charge to live in her house. Now, with her income cut off, she not only had to deal with a son waiting to be taken to court, but a mortgage to pay and Jacob's younger brother to be put through school. Though Jacob received the minimum sentence for manslaughter, his mother had to face local media reports branding her son a killer, the taunting of his younger brother, and as she didn't drive and was no longer able to work at her old job, the unaffordable expense of visiting her son in a prison many miles from home. All this tipped her, once so good at sorting out other families' problems, into a downward spiral of alcohol-related depression. By the time Jacob came out of prison, he'd begun to turn his life around, but it was too late to save his mother. His attempts to impress the social services and his local GP of the seriousness of his mother's illness were ignored until it was too late. She was proud of the way I turned my life around, he told me. But the stigma of the sentence had been too much for his mother to bear. Jacob, a convicted criminal, was able to sort himself out in prison and is now studying to be a criminologist. His mother, blameless of any crime, suffered and died, feeling herself to be the failure. 
After conviction, families have to get used to significantly changed circumstances. The four visits a week which they were allowed during the remand stage are reduced to one a month. The prison may well be many miles away from the family home, requiring considerable expense to get there and back, particularly for multiple family members. The conditions on the visits can be deeply depressing. Prisons are not intended to be welcoming. Doors are unlocked and then locked again behind the visitor, two or three times in some cases. If there have been drugs involved in the crime, then children and adults have to run the gauntlet of body searches and sniffer dogs. As one family visitor I talked to put it, as soon as you walk through those doors, you feel you're being judged. You feel like you're a prisoner yourself. Once inside, they meet their convicted family member in a large open interview room under the watchful eye of uniformed prison staff who make sure that a child cannot run towards his father or mother for a hug or vice versa. For partners too, where greetings or farewells are allowed, it's closed lip kisses only. Besides these physical restrictions are the often much less tolerable emotional stresses as the combination of separation, guilt and shame begins to take its toll. Often these stresses become too great for people to bear and prison visits dry up and the offender is left to find their place in a new family, the family of fellow prisoners. Some take refuge in their new family because they can't face the old one. A probation officer I talked to saw many fathers unable to deal with the feeling that they had failed their family. They can sometimes barely recognize their own children, certainly can't remember their birthdays, I was told. Instead, they fall back on the reassurance of prison routine, the removal of all the intolerable pressures that drove them to commit crimes in the first place. They embrace a world of order, routine, and the relief of knowing exactly where the limits are. Imagine then being swept up out of the prison and flown 60, 70, 100 miles away to the family home and you will see there is no such feeling of reassurance and stability. The state may have done its work and the court passed down its verdict. The offender may have been removed from the streets but for those left behind there is no such thing as a comfortable conclusion. A mother has been removed from her children Fathers find themselves unable to cope. Children of 10 or 11 become the ones who have to run the household. Wives and mothers and husbands and partners find that they're ostracized, unable to keep their jobs because of their association with a lawbreaker. The children are bullied at school or in trying to compensate for the shame of what has happened, become the bullies themselves. One woman who'd been a social worker for 24 years couldn't control tears of frustration as she told me, old friends turn their back on you. People stop talking to the children. Sometimes the parent or parents are unable to deal with the situation and have to see their children taken in by social services. The drink and drugs that might have precipitated crime in the first place becomes a way for the innocent to deal with the stigma of life with a convicted criminal in the family. And the whole cycle begins again. In prison, not a lot can happen. The daily routine providing a regular, if monotonous, structure to life behind bars. For the family outside, everything can happen. For they're in a world which has not been deliberately slowed down, but in many ways flung into overdrive as families try to rebalance their lives. In cases of serious crime, they might have to deal with relocation and all the insidious pressures of living under police protection in a place with which they have no connection and where they have no friends. Daily life becomes a series of little lies and deceits as parents or relatives have to deal with the question of what to tell the children. One child had been told their father had gone to work for the Queen, another that he was working at a police car wash, another that their father was travelling abroad. The mother in question told me ruefully that her husband must have been round the world several times, so often did she use this line. For those parents determined to maintain contact and tell children the truth, there are obstacles in the way. The prison visits are strictly limited and can be traumatic for a child. Even babies have to be searched as desperate people will sometimes hide drugs inside nappies. 
The prison officers themselves hate this part of a job in which there's no way of avoiding hurt and intrusion. In an already soured atmosphere, emotional spontaneity is discouraged and displays of love and affection must be curbed. But a child who may recoil from the coldness of a prison visit cannot compensate by ringing their parent from home. Prisoners are not allowed incoming calls. But for many, the hardest part is still to come. And that is, ironically, when a sentence has been served and the offender steps out of prison, free at last. One woman I spoke to who had served an eight-year sentence referred to what she described as a Dunkirk spirit that prevailed when she was still in prison, a pulling together, a supreme effort by family and friends to make the best of the situation. On release, all the tensions, resentments, anger and hostility that this Dunkirk spirit had suppressed for so long spilled out. As she walked free, she felt for the first time the pent-up anger and resentment that her children could no longer contain. The idea that the doors swing open and the prisoner is welcome with open arms is a dangerous misconception. In her case, she had to wait six years before her daughter felt able to give her a hug. Time had passed while she was inside, time that could never be recovered. Nothing within, was in the same place anymore. The neat hole in family life that she thought she'd now come back to fill had been filled by others in the years she'd been away. She had to accept the hard truth that relatives who had filled the breach since she was in prison were now much closer to her children than she was. And to make matters worse, the eldest of her five children had cracked under, res under the responsibility of keeping the family together and in one mad moment found himself in a fight. He was arrested, convicted of actual bodily harm, and the whole cycle she'd been through began again through her son. Punishment doesn't end when the sentence has been served. For many, that's when it's just beginning. I thank everyone from voluntary groups to the Ministry of Justice for so willingly and generously providing help and information for this lecture. But most of all, I'm in debt to the prisoners and their families who have talked with me so frankly and so passionately. They're the voices which need to be heard, the voices from inside prison, from inside communities, from inside families. They have so much to teach us, and if we're prepared to learn and listen, we can go some way to making our prisons places not of fear and violence, but to echo the fine words of the Justice Secretary of reform, rehabilitation, and redemption. Thank you.